Muslims will come to you, will come to us. A lot of Muslims will come to us and they will say, Akhi, my wife is possessed. My daughter is possessed. Or they have magic done to them. Can you recite over them? They believe you going to remove the jinn. It's not you. It is Allah. That's why the asu, the origin in removing, doing ruqya, is you doing it to yourself. Because you don't need somebody to come between you and Allah. That's what they do in the church. Where they go to the church and they confess their sins to the priest. They say, oh, oh preacher, oh, father, I've done this and I've done. We don't need that. Just like we don't need a middle person to make dua to Allah, we don't need a middle person to do ruqya. Ruqya from a different person is when you cannot do it for yourself. You don't, you don't know how to. Or you're not physically capable. So someone else can recite over you. And if you get someone else, it should be someone who's skilled in it. Only time someone in, like me should do it, who I have knowledge of how to do it, but I'm not skilled in that. I don't have, I have very little experience. I do have experience because I've done it before, but I'm not, that's not something that I regularly do. So that a person usually come and ask me my first question. And I say to you brothers, especially those in part of the administration, because you have a, a lot of that here, because there's a lot of Muslims that's not from America here in Buffalo. One of the things we find in certain communities Jinn possession is well known, like the Somalian community, for example. We hear a lot of jinn possession happening there. For what reason, Allah knows best. But it happens in other communities. When they come to us, the first thing we should say to them, um, ask the details of the situation. And then once they give the details, you ask the name of the person, what's the situation? And they tell you the details. Can they recite ah, Can that person read Arabic? Can they read the Quran? Do they know how to make dua? Do they do like this? Yes. Are they able to? Yes. They hear. Then you give them a list of what to do. Or have them come to me. I'll give them a list. This is what you recite after Fajr. This is what you recite after du after Asr or after Maghrib. Like this. Every day. You do these certain things over water and this, this, like this. So the legislation of Islam is done for yourself. Then if they say, well, she cannot or he cannot, then we step in and say, oh, we will come to them and recite. But here go the number of someone who's skilled in it. I only become a last resort. You only become a last resort because they have nobody. When nobody's there, then somebody got to step up and help their brother or help their sister who have the knowledge. Is that clear? That's important to understand. So we move on. Now we move on to Surah Al-Baqarah. To Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah after the Basmala, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Allah begins the ayah what? Alif Lam Mim. Alif Lam Mim. It begins with that. Now, this statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the well-known thing that we say in regards to Baqarah is that no one knows the meaning of these words, right? This is what you hear. Only Allah knows. What people don't tell us, there is another position about that from the scholars. Some sahabas interpreted it like Ibn Abbas. But the more senior companions, like Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman, these scholars, they're the more senior of the scholars, of the Sahaba. Their position was only Allah knows the true meaning. But we have companions like Abu Bakr, I mean like uh, Ibn Abbas, who have actually interpreted those verses. So just to let, there are Sahaba who has done that. And if a person works by those narrations, we don't find fault with him who works by those narrations. But for someone to come later and say, well, it means this and it means that, these Aleph Lam Mim or Aleph Lam Ra 
or kaf ha ya ain sod. Words like this, I it's like that. They say it means this or that with their own interpretation. We reject that from them. But what the Sahabas did, we don't reject that if it's authentically reported from them, as long as none of the other Sahabas opposed it. Okay? Uh, so things like, like this, for example, I'm just to show an example of this. In Tafsir, of Imam, uh, 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 from the Tafsir of Imam al Razi, I mean Abu Hatim, which is considered the oldest tafsir of the Quran and it was the main source of the tafsir of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Prophet. You will find today in the tafsirs of the Quran of the well known accepted books of tafsir, like Tafsir bin Kathir, right? Taf tafsir, as as the other tafsirs from the earlier tafsirs. You will find a lot of times they will not mention what the Sahaba's position was, was about about different verses for different because a lot of times the Sahabas would bring narrations from the Jews. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hadith an Bani Israel wala Hadith. He said, narrate from the children of Israel, meaning the Jews, no problem. Right? And he made clear whatever they say. If it don't oppose the Quran and Sunnah, we don't reject it, nor do we accept it. We don't reject it, nor do we accept it. Okay, because if we reject it, it may be the haq. If we, if we accept it, it may be balta. So that's why the Prophet said, Hadith an Bani Israel. Narrate from the children of Israel, and there's no problem. Okay? So this is a position that you have many of the Sahabas, especially Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar, rather the Messenger of Allah, quoted from the Israelis. But if it comes from the Prophet, we know for certain that is the Haq. As an example of this in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, when we get past Surah Al-Fatiha, you got narrations. It says, Ibn Hatim, he says, Ukhtulifa fi tafsirihi ala awjuh. That there are difference of opinion in the tafsir of Aleph Lamin. And then from different aspects from the Sahaba. He says, Some have said Aleph Lamin means, And Allahu A'lam. I am Allah the Most High. And took Anna uh, from Anna, the Aleph from Anna, Allah, the Lamb from there, A'lam, the mean from A'lam, Aleph Lamin. Ibn Abbas said this, as was narrated by Sa'id ibn Ashadji, down to Ibn Abbas, where he said, Alif la mean, qala, he said, An Allahu a'lam, I am Allah the most knowledgeable. That's what An Allahu a'lam mean. I am Allah the most knowledgeable. So these, Sa'id ibn Jubayr narrated this, and it's Bahak. You have, so you have narrations from the Salaf interpreting these things, but we, we don't reject it. Because they could have gotten that from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Y'all ever heard of the hadith Or narration of Imam Ahmed When it was said he memorized the million hadith Two, uh, two, two million or a million, two million Over a million hadith That which is unauthentic And that which is authentic, right? So when you hear this Here go a question Do there exist a million hadith of the Prophet? Huh? No, it do not. Does not exist that many narrations from our prophet. So what is meant when they say Imam Ahmed memorized over a million hadiths? Now that's not that many hadiths, even with unauthentic hadiths. Combined with the authentic, doesn't meet, meet that much. Many of the scholars of the past considered narrations from the three generations, the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, the, and, the tab, and what they say about the Quran, especially the Sahaba, narrations from the Sahabas and the Tabi'een, what they say about the Quran, a lot of scholars consider that as hadiths. Even though they don't say they got it from the Prophet all the time. Why is that? Because there's no way possible they came to those conclusions except that they had to get it from the Prophet. You understand? Mm -hmm. So because of this, some scholars, many of the ulama considered them as narration. They used to memorize them. 
because it helped you understand the Quran. Okay? And we know that the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, from the science of hadith, all of the Sahabas is a udul, are trustworthy in narrating. They're not like anybody else. They all considered trustworthy in what they narrated from the Prophet because of what the Messenger of Allah said about his companions. We are not like the Shia who make disbelievers of the Sahaba. So because of this, many of their narrations about what verses from the Quran mean are considered like hadith. Is that clear? Mm. Now, so now we go back. Alif Lam هذه الحروف وغيرها من الحروف المقطعة في أوائل السور. He says that these letters and other than it, alif lam mim and other letters that surahs begin with just one letter or with few letters. He says that these are called الحروف المقطعة, the cut off letters. What we mean by cut off? They don't have dhamma tan at the end. Like it's not alifun, lam mun. Mim mun alif lam mim. They cut off from one another, so that's they call the cut off letters. Okay. He says that begin that comes in the beginning of the surah, the surahs, the chapters of the Quran. Allahu a'lam a'lamu bi maradi. Allah knows best to their meanings of them. But why? Why is this? Why would? It, why is Allah giving this? Us this from the Quran And he don't tell us the meaning Why do y'all think Allah has done that I mean I want to see if anybody can Answer this question Why do you Because in Arabic uh, It's going to be those all Arabic uh, word. That's why and Allah this one. No that's not the reason But I understand why you said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Is teaching us Your knowledge is limited your knowledge is limited. You only know what I teach you. And you will magnify Allah more. Because you know I'm only, my worth is only from Allah. You understand? Listen what he says here in the tafsir. وَفِيهَا إِشَارَةٌ إِلَى إِعْجَازُ Quran. Also Allah does this to point to the the miracle of the Quran that there's things that only Allah knows the meaning of. فَقَدْ وَقَعَ بِهِ تَحَدِّ الْمُشْرِكِينَ That's why Allah challenges the polytheists to bring verses like it. فَعَجِزُوا عَنْ مَعَارَضَتِهِ And they cannot, they are incapable of meeting this challenge. Like Allah Ta'ala says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبَدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ that if you are in doubt about what we revealed to our slave, our worshiper Muhammad, then come with one sort of like it. And what's the shortest sort of the Quran? Inna a'tayna kal kawfar. Fasalli li rabbika wanhar. Inna shani akahu al abatar. Allah says, bring one sort of like that. Can't do it to this day in Arabic. Nobody's able to write an eloquent book with intelligent. Poise and message like the book of Allah. Till this day, Allah put this challenge out 1400 years ago. No one has been able to do it. And trust me, many have and was not successful. So Allah put this challenge out. They can't even repeat Alif Lam They can't do it. They can't even repeat to find something like that. And so here, understand that reality. Also, these letters in which comprises of the Arabic language. It sh is, now, the Quran was revealed at a time where the Arabs were at their peak in the Arabic language. Arabic reached its full greatest level of eloquency when the Quran came down. Okay? Pay attention to this. All, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the prophet before him was Isa. And the prophet before Isa was Musa, right? Now, each one of these prophets, as all prophets, they all had a miracle to prove their prophecy, right? What was Moses' miracle? His hand turned white. 
his staff turned into a snake when he threw it down, right? What else? Well, that is one of his miracles, but his first immediate some miracles. You know, so these miracles he had, why? Be, notice, magic and the practice of sorcery had reached its peak during the time. Science had a high level at that time. And so Allah gave him a sign that outdid that, that proved the falsehood of that. That was his sign of his prophecy. Isa, during his time, medicine was at the highest peak in, tech, in, in being able to heal people and do things, and, but they was unable to heal what he was able to heal. So Allah used that as a sign. The messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Arabs had reached their peak in eloquency in the Arabic language. From that time, it start, after that, it starts to go downhill for the Arabic language for the Arabs. They don't have, like no Arab, no matter how well he knows Arabic, will ever speak like they did. They didn't make no mistakes. Arabic, the Quran was revealed at that time. And Allah made it an Arabic Quran to an Arab people. And that they could not meet the challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in front of them. And he, it's an Arab race. So in spite of that, the idols were incapable to come with the likes of the Quran, even though they was the most eloquent of idols to, in history at that time. They couldn't come with the likes of what Allah brought in the Quran. Ma'a in spite of the fact they were the most eloquent of the idols ever. Okay, they were the most eloquent of the Arabs ever. Because the Quran was from Allah. The Quran was from Allah. And it wasn't for Muhammad. One of the things the Arabs knew, like every one of us, we know him based on how he talked, how he looked. He got a way of speaking. You have a way of speaking. Every individual in here has their own style of speaking, correct? That distinguished them from the next person. Correct? So did the messenger of Allah. He was the most eloquent of the Arabs. But yet, when the Quran was revealed, the Arabs knew that that wasn't Muhammad's speech. They knew he couldn't speak like that. They knew nobody could speak like this. So they instantly knew the Quran was God's speech, Allah's speech. They didn't doubt that. They knew it because that's so that was one of the things to prove that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not talking from himself because it was like if I want to make up something, it's going to sound like me. I write it. It's going to be like how I write. When the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with the Quran, they instantly knew that's not his speech. That's why in the beginning they said he got it from somebody else that's not out of. But that was a lie, too, because it was pure Arabic. It was pure Arabic. So understand that. That's another sign of the greatness of the Quran that is from Allah. That it wasn't even the way Muhammad spoke. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it wasn't a speech that came from Muhammad. So when we say alif lam mean, understand this is a miracle from Allah and showing the astonishing, amazing things of the Quran and distinguished quality of the Quran that nobody can compete with. And yes, some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum have interpreted these words. But others of the Sahaba said, of the more senior companions in knowledge looked at, only Allah knows their real meaning. Okay? Only people we, another lesson we learned today, the only people we accept their interpretation is from the Sahaba. Nobody else. Like Ibn Abbas. Okay? So I gave an example of that. And that narration is authentic. Now, after that, Allah Ta'ala says, That is the book that has no doubt in it. A guidance for the people of taqwa. The first ayah, Alif Lam Mim, we covered that. Second ayah, that is the book. It has no doubt in it. A guidance for the people of Taqwa. Uh, they said, Tafsir al Muyassir, the author says, Thalika, that meaning the Quran, who al Kitab is the book, meaning the only true book. 
ذلك الكتاب يعني ذلك القرآن that Quran is the book right the tremendous book in Arabic I want y'all to understand something in Arabic you got the word how do you say this in Arabic does anybody know does anybody know yes Hada means this. How do you say that in Arabic? Is dhalika. We call this in Arabic ismul ishara, a noun of indication. So, hada is for indicating anything close to me. Hada. Hada. Okay? Hada qalam. Okay? Or hada hatif. We call in Arabic or mobile. Okay, <laughs> that's English word Arabatize. But first, how we say we could either call this mahmul, which means carried, or it's called hatif, something that transfer voices and sounds. Okay, that's that proper Arabic. Fosa hatif or uh, or mahmul. The Arabized English word mobile for mobile. <laughs> this is for what's close. If I'm pointing to something far away, like the chair over there, which in Arabic is kursi, I can say, Dharika kursiyu. Dharika kursiyu. So, Dharika is for indicating something away from you. Okay? That's why we say, that's a chair. Hada kursiyun, that I'm sitting on right now, because it's next to me, this is a chair. But Allah, he says, al kitab. that is the book. A book, when he revealed it, was in, on, in, on parchments, dog on the bones of animals, written on tanned skin, written on smooth rocks. Allah said, al kitab. What is he talking about? Why is he saying that? What's in the Lohan Mahfuz? The one there his throne. When he said the speech and had it written in there. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ ذَلِكَ الْقُرْآنِ هُوَ الْكِتَابِ That is the book. لا ريب فيه. Has no doubt. He says, أَلَّذِي لَا شَكَّ أَنَّهُ مِنْ عِنْدِ لَا When it says, there is no doubt. What is no doubt? That is the book. There is no doubt. What is no doubt? What do y'all think Allah's meaning here when he say, there is no doubt? I'm asking to see if anybody know. What do Allah mean? That is the book. And there in it is no doubt. No doubt about what? Anybody you know? It's perfection. No, it's the speech of Allah. <sighs> Excellent. That is from Allah. There's no doubt that the Quran is from Allah. No doubt. No doubt. And if you want to make up a doubt, we got all the proof to remove your doubt. Wallahi, we got all the proof. I'm just going to give one example. And we didn't talk further. I want to have a include in this class one day. Talk about the Barakatul Quran. The blessings of the Quran and how to, how to achieve the blessings of the Quran. Because the Quran is blessed, right? And there's only seven ways you can obtain this blessing. It's not a book you just you do anything with you, anything you want with it. There's only a certain way you can obtain the blessings of the Quran. But as far as this is concerned, think about it. The Quran came from Allah. He is Tabarak. He is the blessed. He gave it to an angel that is blessed, Jibreel. And the other angels that brought it, Samayats down. He gave, he sent it down on a blessed night, Laylatul Qadr. He sent the Quran down on a blessed month, Ramadan. And he sent it to a blessed man, Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tell me what book has that? No book. That is the book. No doubt in it. So here, he's saying, that is the Quran. It is, a, it is the tremendous book. 
الَّذِي لَا شَكَّ that in which there is no doubt أَنَّهُ مِنْ عِنْدِ لَا that it comes from Allah. Allah is perfect, so His book is perfect. Allah is perfect, so His book is perfect. And Allah will not allow any book to be perfect except for His book. He won't allow it. The greatest book after the Quran is Sahih Bukhari. And it got mistakes in it. Because Allah won't allow nothing to be perfect but his book. Sallallahu wa jal. Then the Shaykh he says, after that, what does mean that there's no doubt in it, meaning that it's from Allah? So what does what does that mean now? Understand. Tadabbur, pondering, reflecting over the Quran cannot happen till you know the explanation, the tafsir. Pondering over the Quran means what? The word tadabbur is from the word dubur, which means ending, the end of something. Meaning, what's the ending result of the verses? Where, what is its objective? Where is it trying to take me? Where is it trying to take us? Where is this explanation, this re reason for revelation? Where is this verse trying to take me? Because this verse is, is meant, this Quran is meant for everybody to Yom Qiyamah. When me and y'all of us in this room is dead and gone, the Quran going to still be here to benefit mankind. So, the point now is that I understand what we're supposed to get from this tafsir. So what we get out of Allah telling us, La Raybafi, there's no doubt in it. What we were supposed to come from that, la tabu. You have no doubt in yourself about it. You have no doubt about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the Shaykh says that here, he says, uh, he says, la fala tabu fi. So that means you can't have doubt in it. There's no doubt in the book. So that means in your heart as a Muslim, you can't have any doubt about what's in this Quran. That is the truth, and it's from Allah. You cannot doubt it. Who's no one more knowledgeable than Allah? No one knows anything greater than Allah. So you must not have any doubt about having to follow this book. You must not have any doubt that this is from Allah. You must not have any doubt. Your only happiness for mankind is in this book. Must not be no doubt in you. Yes. Can I be excused from this late right here? Say it again. Can I be excused from the class and late? No, tafaddal. May Allah heal you, Akhir. So, the author, the sheikh, the, the ulama, they're saying, have no, there, you, you cannot have any doubt in it. وَيَنْتَفِعُ بِهِ muttaqun. And Allah here says what? It is a guidance for the people of taqwa. Right? It is a guidance for the people of taqwa. What does that mean? Meaning, that the people who fear Allah are those who fear Allah and they are the ones who benefit from the Quran. They benefit from it. Meaning they live a life benefiting from the Quran on how to live their lives. They benefit from the book of Allah Azza wa Jal and they follow the legal verdicts of the Quran. They follow the legal verdicts of the Quran. Here's the question. How we follow the legal verdicts if we're not learning the Quran? Right? Is that possible? That makes sense? Can you follow the legal verdicts of a book you don't learn? Then this is, that makes your taqwa being questioned. You understand? So, this doesn't necessitate, you mean you got to memorize the whole Quran, but you should be reading it and reading its tafsir. Okay? Familiarize yourself with the book to the point like you are, it's almost like you memorized it. But you didn't memorize it and understand it. During the time of the Sahaba, عنهم, when the Messenger of Allah used to teach the Quran to them, as we told you before, he would take five or ten verses at a time. And they wouldn't go beyond those five or ten verses till they memorized it. They knew what it mean. They know how to apply it and implement it. They won't go beyond, move on to another five or ten till they can do that with those first five or ten. That's why it took Sahabas like Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab. It took him eight years to memorize Baqarah. Eight years doing this process. So for that reason, Scott Sahabi companions like Anas ibn Malik said, if we saw a man memorize 
Bakara and Ali Imran from amongst us Sahabas, he was looked at as a tremendous man. Why do y'all think that? Why do you think that he they, they saw that person as amazing if he walked around memorizing Bakara and saw the Ali Imran? You're close. That's part of it. What was you going to say? Wa alaykum as told you. You was going to say something to Fadda. Did it take a long time Not because it took a long time. Because they lived those surahs. Because they didn't, they took five or ten verses that they learned what it mean. They learned how to pause, how to recite it, what it, how you're supposed to implement it and practice it. And they didn't go on to another five and ten till they was doing that. So imagine when you got that far with Bakara Ali Imran, you was a walking Bakara and a walking Ali Imran. He was a walking Quran. He command with it. He forbids what, what Allah says in those sorters. He knows all of the legal verdicts in it. So because of that, if a person walked around with those sorters, they were amazed. The Sahaba. He was a tremendous man with them. Wallahi, brothers. Most of the Sahabas didn't finish the Quran, but whatever they memorized of it, they lived it and knew it like the back of their hands. Well, like, let's say everybody, whatever y'all memorize of the Quran, if you knew the tafsir, the reason for revelation, you memorized it. You memorized the explanation. You've been taught how to implement it in your life. Just if you, your first 10 or 20, 15 sorters, you, 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 it'll have a different effect on you when you go, Allahu Akbar, and you recite it in your prayers. Athiru Quran ala man yafhamuhu, wa tadabbaruhu, wa fahimahu, wa tabbaqahu, wa ya'rifu waqf, ayna yaqf, fi tilawatiha, wa yutqinu tilawataha. Hatha raju, athiru Quran alayhi ashaddu min ayy shay. That person is those type of people who can be stabbed when we told the stories where the spear went through the man's leg when he was praying. He still continued to pray. The Quran has this effect. And this point I wanted to get to for us, brothers and sisters, that's listening to us. And that is this. Allah wants you to strive with all of you when it comes to his religion. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu dukhulu fi silmi kaffah wa la tattabi'u khutawat al-shaytan innahu lakum adubun mubeen Allah says, O you who believe, enter into Islam completely, inwardly and outwardly, and do not follow the tricks of shaytan. He is an open enemy to you, a clear enemy to you. Allah wants us to involve ourselves with our worship, with our whole makeup. When you memorize the Quran, and I'm not talking about the whole Quran, but you, you live a lifestyle of learning the Quran. Not I learned five surahs when I was the, took my shahada or when I was a kid, or I got 10 surahs, or I got 30 surahs, but now that I'm a adult, I only got five. But you know nothing of what it means. You have no comprehension of the ahkam, the legal verdict that it is connected to. You know none of these things. The Quran is, you're not putting your mind and soul into it. To keep your Quran, the best place to keep Quran is in the salah. The best place to keep the Quran is in your salah. No other place. That's the best reviewing of your Quran. Hada ahsanu muraja'atul Quran huwa fis salah. That's the best place. Though that portions of the Quran that you review in your prayers is going to be stronger in you than the Quran you review when you sit down. And when you know the tafsir and understand that, it's going to have a better, bigger impact. So when that person prays, he's not praying, just moving his lips, going slow. All those things he learned about that sort of every time he recites it, what he learned of meaning will come to his head. 
And guess what happens next? حينما هو يقرأ القرآن وما تعلم من تفسير والدلالات وفهم والتدبر يظهر كل ما كل ما يتلو هذه الآية يظهر على ذهني يبدو فيه ثم بعد الحين من كثرة هذه معاملة وهذه عادة بالقرآن يزداد فهم ومعادن of هذه الآية so the more that person in his prayer and he reciting in his prayer and he's reciting these surahs that he knows the meanings of and he constantly think about it because every time he recite from memory, the meanings that he learned comes to him. And when you become consistent with that reminding in yourself, it starts to become a new thing where now Allah gives you more meanings, more understanding that's based off the original meaning. And you increase in Iman, and you increase in understanding, and you increase in your everything in your life. That's the goal of the Quran. But when you, brothers and sisters, make salah and you recite the book of Allah, and you don't know what, you, what it means, you don't know none of these things, very little effect. Your mind is not involved in your worship. Allah wants you to wholeheartedly perform this ibadah. You think that's how. When we told the story of, of uh, Imam Bukhari being stung by the hornet and still 17 times, still praying. He, well, he didn't start out like that. He started on this level. He keep reciting, be entertaining him. It entertained him. This is how the Salaf did it with the book of Allah. And we can do the same thing. Your 20 sorters, you are master of those sorters. Can nobody quote them sorters except that you know what it means, how to apply it, you know how to recite it, you know everything about it. That's the believer with the book of Allah. Because Allah Ta'ala says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun. Liyaddabbaru, yani ha'ulai atba'u Muhammad. Liyaddabbaru ayati wa yatadhakaru ulul albaab. Allah says, this is a blessed book that we reveal to you, Muhammad, in order that they, meaning his followers, will deeply ponder over the lessons from this surah and will take admonition from it, those who have understanding. Imagine the character of this believer. People will say to me, Muslims who do this and do that, they Muslims. I say, man, these people ain't on no Islam, don't know nothing about Islam. This is the description of the believer right here. And nobody trying to learn a deen like that because they don't want to be happy. You are personally choosing to not be happy, to experience true happiness that Allah's book can offer you for some stupid reason your mind and convince you to say, I'm not worth getting close to Allah like that. I'm not worth increasing my mind and my soul and my spirituality. Like, I'm not worth it. I'm a nobody. I don't need my Lord like that. I need that money. I need that job. I need this. I need that. I don't need a lot. I just, at least I pray. Khalas. This is the attitude of most of us. And then we don't understand why the masjid is empty. Then we don't understand why the classes are empty. Then we don't understand why I'm having these marital problems, these problems with this and problems with that, when the solution is right here in the book of Allah. Allah has made a serious connection between Tilawa, reciting his book, and Salah, and praying. Allah has made a connection to that. Inna ladina yatluna kitab Allah wa aqamu salah. Listen what Allah is saying. Verily those who recite the Quran. The word yatlu means to recite and follow it. Talawa means to recite and follow, which requires knowledge. Inna ladina yatluna kitab Allah. Verily those who recite the book of Allah and follow the book of Allah. Wa aqamu salah. And they establish the prayer. What? They are engaging in a tijaratun lan tabur. They are engaging in a business transaction that will never cease. Will never be Destroyed. What happinesses can be greater than that? We don't get it as Muslims, man. So we're about to come to a close conclusion. He says, we're just going to cover the first five ayats. So here, this is what is meant. The Quran is a guidance 
Meaning it benefits the people of taqwa Those who fear Allah And they follow its ahkam Its legal verdicts Then Allah Ta'ala says In describing the muttaqin He said it's a guidance for the muttaqin How? They benefit from it like we just said Who are the muttaqin? Oh subhanAllah Get that back to me I'll get, a little, I'll get excited and move my hands Because I love teaching this deen Allahu Akbar Sorry about that, people. I knocked it off the table. So now Allah, Al-An, Ba'dama, Dhakara, Hud Al-Quran, Hudan Lil Muttaqi. Man al Muttaqin. Yasifuhum Ba'dain. He described them afterwards. Allah Ta'ala says, Alladina Yu'minuna Bil Ghaibi. Alladina Yu'minuna Bil Ghaibi. Those who believe in the unseen. وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ They are the people who establish the prayer. وَمِمَّا رَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And from that which we provide for them, they spend. They spend it. He didn't say if they rich, if they poor, if they got money, they spend it for Allah's sake. According to their capability. Three descriptions of a people of taqwa. The people who take guidance from the Quran, what's the first description? They believe in the unseen. And the second description, they establish the salah, pray properly. Third description, they spend from what Allah gives them. Right? The Sheikh says, the ulama here says in the tafsir, ayah number three, وَهُمَ الَّذِينَ يُصَدِّقُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ they are those who believe in the unseen. The unseen are the things that their senses cannot reach. What's your senses? Hearing, smelling, taste, looking, right? You can't reach the unseen, the ghaib with those things. They believe in it like they can hear it, like they can see it, like they can smell it. They believe in it like that. How is that possible? How is that possible? Kira, reading the Quran, reading the hadiths about the belief in the five, six pillars of Iman. You go over that and over that and over that till it's like you can smell it, taste it, hear it, see it. You understand? So he says. Nor can their intellects reach it. Wahdaha by itself. Because there's no way to know the unseen except through revelation. Right? Except through revelation of Allah. Ila Rusuli that he sent to his messengers. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mithl malaika, like the belief in the angels, or belief in the Jannah, or belief in the Nar, the hellfire, or belief in other than that, from the various things, yani wa ghayru dhalika mimma akhbar Allahu bihi aw akhbar bihi rasulu, from those things that Allah and His Messenger has informed us about them. So that requires seeking knowledge. You understand? That requires having knowledge of these things. Wahum was the sec that's the first attribute. So you got to be studying. How many of us have who have how many of us can say ask yourself how many books of aqidah I read about belief in the six pillars? How many have I read? How many of us read it in the Quran? The ayahs about what's the hadith? Can anybody tell me the hadith about the uh, the six pillars? Who knows how to quote what the six pillars is in the order that the prophet reveals revealed to the prophet? Sorry, Sallam. Does anybody know that? Like the hadith of Jibreel. He said, Ma mal iman. What is al iman? What did the Prophet what did the Prophet tell Jibreel when he, when he asked him? And took me not to believe in what? Allah. What took me no billahi? What was the second thing? Nope. That's not the order it came. Huh? Malaika. Number two is the angel. And took me no billahi wa malaika tihi. To believe in Allah and his angels. To believe in his kutubi. Oh, and took me na billahi. Wa malaikatihi. Wa kutubihi. His books. Wa rusuli. His messengers. 
Wal yawm al akhir, the last day. Come on, what's next? Wa an tu'mina and to believe in the qadar, the predestination, khayrihi, the good of it, wa sharrihi, the evil of it. Every Muslim should know this like the back of his hand. In that order. It shouldn't be taken out of order. Why? The book comes before the angels. You can't get the... Allah comes before everything. Then the angels come before the books because they bring the book to us. Then the book, what they bring is the books. The messenger can't come before Allah, his angels, or the books. Then the messengers after the books. And then after the messengers is the last day. Because we can't know the last day without the messengers teaching us about the last day. Right? And then... Lastly, the qadr, the predestination, the good of it and bad of it. How many of us can honestly say what books me and my family have read about it and said we studied anything about it? I'm not asking, looking for nobody to answer that. But this is something we have to ask ourselves. So the sheikh, he says here, he says, that was number one. Number three, number two, وَمَنْ يُحَافِذُونَ عَلَىٰ أَدَاءِ الصَّلَاةِ فِي مَوَاقِيتِهَا أَدَاءٍ صَحِيحًا وَفْقَ ما شرع الله لنبيه محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ومما أعطيناهم عفوا هذا الثالثة صفة الثالثة he says that they preserve the performance of the prayer at its proper time with a correct performance of those preferred prayers in in that it is an agreement with what Allah legislated for His Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad on how to pray. That's how they preserve the prayer. Meaning they know its pillars, its conditions, its obligations, and its sunnahs. Okay? They learn these things. That's the only way you're going to learn how to pray properly. And then he says the second thing, the third descriptions of the people of taqwa. He says, And from that which we have given them, min al mal of wealth, they give out the charity of their wealth that is obligatory and that which is recommended. You understand? So this is the attribute. If you want to be for the people of taqwa who benefit from the guidance of the Quran, you got to have these three descriptions in your life. Is that clear? Last no, ayat number four. Allah Ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ It's back to Iman again. Though, and those who believe بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ What was revealed to you, Muhammad. وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبِلَكَ They believe in that which was revealed before you, Muhammad. وَبِالْآخِرَةِ And in regards to the hereafter, هُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ They have certainty about يَوْمُ الْآخِرَ How are you going to have certainty about something you don't study? How, can you be certain about something you never learned or you rarely know about? No, you cannot. How you become good at your job and be certain about it? You, you learned it and you keep doing it, right? So you become certain. I got this. I don't need no help. I know this job inside and out. Why you can't do that for your iman and your hereafter? Study the book of Allah. Read it until you truly get it. Because wallahi, we have things inside of us, as we said before, that... Only way it's going to leave us is through deeply studying your belief as a Muslim. These six pillars. And then he says, Allah Ta'ala says, or the Shaykh said a tafsir for the ayah, الَّذِينَ يُصَدِّقُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ يَا مُحَمَّدٌ They are those who believe in that which revealed to you, O Muhammad, مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Of the Qur'an. وَبِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ Min al hikmah and what was revealed to you, Muhammad, of the hikmah, the wisdom, which is the, his sunnah. What was revealed to you of his sunnah? Wa he is sunnah. Wa bi kulli ma unzila min qablika ala rusuli min kutub. And that which was also every single thing that was revealed before you, Muhammad, to the messengers of books, kat Torah, like the book given to Moses called the Torah, or the Injil, the book given to Jesus, Isa. And other than those two books, they believe in it. That came to the previous prophets. You They believe in the home, the abode, the home of the real life, which is the akhirah, after death. 
الحساب, and that which is in that life of being taking account for your choices you made in this life and of jaza and the rewards and punishments that will come from the choices we made in this life but you see here Allah specifically mentioned the akhirah the hereafter he specified that iman bihi because believing in the akhirah min a'dham al bawa'ith ala fi'l ta'at wa ijtinab al muharramat wa muhasabat al nafs why does Allah specify yawm al akhirah huna here why he's saying here he mentioned cuz how the ayah go wal ladina yu'minuna bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila min qablika they believe in that which was revealed to you, Muhammad, and what was revealed before you. Wasn't Yom Al-Akhir revealed to the Prophet? So that's included in it already. But then Allah came and specifically mentioned, وَبِنْ akhirati, And in the hereafter, whom you qinun. They are certain about it. Why? The Sheikh says here, because when you have belief in the Akhirah, you understand it, and you believe in it, believing in that is the greatest push to make you do acts of obedience. That's the thing that pushes you to do acts of obedience to Allah. Knowing about the punishments, the rewards, what's in Jannah, what you get for this. If you do this, you get this reward. If you do this sin, you get this punishment. Learning that is the greatest thing that pushes you to be obedient to Allah. He says, third, secondly, learning about the Akhirah, it helps you avoid the Haram because you know the punishment. Like the Prophet Sallallahu talked about in the, in the grave, the barzakh, about the people, the zunat, the people who commit fornication and adultery, right? They're going to be in the pot. The bottom is thin and the upper part is wide. A pot, you ever seen a pot like that? Small bottom on the pot and it widens on the top. And he saw the Prophet people in this pot. And flames would come up and they would try, they were raised to the top. He was asked, who was these people? They were the people who committed fornication and adultery in the dunya. When you hear about stuff like this, it makes you stay away from sin. And you constantly read about these things. And Allah talks about it in the Quran in different ways. That's not the hellfire. That's the barzakh. We got three abodes. Three places we going to live. Earth, number two is Barzakh, number three is Hellfire Paradise. And the last one, Hellfire Paradise, some people paradise forever, some people Hellfire forever. Some people from amongst the Muslims Hellfire for a period of time, and then paradise forever. So when you learn about the Akhirah, min a'zam al bawa'ith, it is the greatest inspire inspiration and thing that pushes you to do acts of obedience. And it's the thing that pushes you to stay away from the haram. And the third thing, learning about the akhirah does, nafs, making you take account of your deeds now. Weighing what you do every day. The sahabas at the end of the day, they used to strike their feet and say at the end of the day, what have you earned for me today? Min khayrin wa sharrin, of good and bad. Take an account now. Like Umar ibn Khattab said, Hasibu an fusakum kabalan tu hasibu. Weigh your deeds now before they weighed for you, Yomu Qiyam. Wazinu a'malakum kabla an tu zanu. Weigh your, take weight of your deeds before they weighed for you. Al yom, yomul amal. Today, is the day of actions, meaning this dunya. Well, ghadan, yomul jaza. The next life is getting the reward or punishment for your choices. Is that clear? And then the last ayah we're going to cover today, ayah number five, where Allah Ta'ala says, Ula'ika ala hudam mir rabbihim. And they are those who upon the guidance who are upon the guidance of their lord they are those that are upon the guidance from their lord mean right wa ulaika humul muflihun and they are those who are the successful this is their last description of the people who benefit who from the people of taqwa 
which is what? Ashabu hadihi sifat, the shaykh, the ulama say in this tafsir book, the companions of these qualities and attributes that we just mentioned, they are ala upon nur. Their name nur. They are upon light. Tawfiq, success from Allah. They are upon light. What is the light? Remember, if we cut this light off, we can't see. So nur here means guidance. So the guidance is a light for them to see their way through this earth and how to live with the current things that the world is upon. The believer don't follow what every time Dick and Harry does, whatever Ali, Zahid, and this person does. But the believer follows what Qala Muhammad said, what Muhammad said. What Qala Allah, what Allah said, sorry. What Qala Rasulullah, what the Messenger of Allah said. What Qala Sahaba, what the companion said and did. That's how we move about. So these people, he's saying, are the, who have these attributes, they are in hudan. They're upon guidance from the Lord, meaning upon a, living a life of light. Their life is lit up with the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah being implemented in their life. And they're granted tawfiq, success from Allah to implement it. Min khaliqihim, from their Lord. Wahadihim, the one who guided them. And Allah says, what? They are muflihun, they are the successful. What is the successful description? Allah said they are the successful, the muflihun. What is the description of the successful? They, the Sheikh says, the ulama say, Humul faizun al ladina adraku ma talabu. Wa najaw bin sharri ma minhu harabu. They are those who are successful in this dunya because they reach the things that they sought, which is the Jannah. They're going to reach it. That's why Allah called them successful. They achieved it with being patient. Their reward for what they were patient upon in the dunya was, was gardens of paradise and embroidered silk. That's what we're getting. Their reward for what they did in the dunya is the garden of Eden. Underneath which rivers flow, abiding therein forever. Don't y'all all want that? This is the purpose of what we do. Allah, the Sheikh says, they are those who are successful, those who reach what they were seeking through their obedience, those who are, have found salvation from the evil of what they were trying to run away from in this dunya. We try to run away from sin. We try to run away from disobedience. We try to run away from bad speech. We try to run away from all the evils that Allah and his messenger defined as evil. They flee from it. And so they was given salvation from the thing they ran away from. Meaning they're going to die into paradise and never see those things they ran away from in the dunya ever again to be challenged and tested with. All they had to do was be patient. Is that clear? And this is what we present for the day. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.